Hey, we're reading Henry VIII by William Shakespeare and John Fletcher. Oh, double billing. Adapted by Taylor Phillips. Yeah. Yay. Tonight, playing King Henry, prologue and epilogue. Thomas Kane. Playing Cardinal Wolsey, Lord Chancellor. Bernie Bozio. Playing Queen Catherine, gardener, first gentleman, old lady. Is both. Playing Duke of Norfolk and Lovell. Marty Goldberg. Playing Buckingham, Cranmer, gentleman. Michael Janot. Playing Lord Chamberlain, Buckingham Surveyor. David Mackler. Playing the Duke of Suffolk, third gentleman, Capuchius. Valerie O'Hara. Playing Anne Boleyn, Patience, Cromwell. Uh, Taylor Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> Playing Earl of Surrey, Brandon, second gentleman, Campius, servant. John DeFilippo. Me. Act one, prologue. Enter prologue. I come no more to make you laugh. Things now that bear a weighty and serious brow, sad, high, and working, full of state and woe. Such noble scenes as draw the eye to flow, we now present. Therefore, for sadness is from the first and happiest hearers of the town, be sad as we would make you. Think you see the very persons of our noble story as they were living. Think you see them great and followed with the general throng and sweat of thousand friends. Then in a moment see how soon this mightiness meets misery. And you can be merry then, I'll say, a man may weep upon his wedding day. Scene one, London, an antechamber in the palace. Enter Duke of Norfolk, at one door, at the other, Duke of Buckingham. Good morrow and well met. How have you done since the last we saw in France? I thank your grace, healthful, and ever since a fresh admirer of what I saw there. Ah, oh, an untimely ague stayed me a prisoner in my chamber when those sons of glory, those two lights of men met in the Vale of Endren. Ah, uh, then you lost the, the view of earthly glory. Men might say till this time pomp was single, but now married to one above itself. Each following day become the next day's master till the last made former wonders its. Today the French, all quinquant, all in gold, like heathen gods, shone down the English and tomorrow they made Britain India. Every man that stood showed like a mine, their dwarfish pages as cherubins, all guilt. The madams too, not used to toil, did almost sweat to bear the pride upon them that their very labor was to them as a painting. The two kings, equal in luster, were now best, now worst. As presents did present them, him and I still him in praise. And being present both, t'was said they saw but one, and no discerner durst wag his tongue in censure. When these sons, for so they praise them, by their heralds challenged the noble spirits to arms, they did perform beyond thought's compass, and all was royal. To the disposing of it naught rebelled. Order gave each thing view, the office did distinctly his full function. Who did guide? Uh uh, I mean, who set the body and the limbs of this great sport together? As you guess. One certes that promises no element in such a business. I pray you who, my lord? All this was ordered by the good discretion of the right reverend Cardinal of York. Oh, the devil speed him. No man's pie is freed from his ambitious finger. What had he to do with these fierce vanities? Surely, sir, there's in him stuff that puts him to these ends. For, being not propped by ancestry of grace out of his self-drawing web, 
gives us note, the fourth merit makes his way, a gift that heaven gives for him, which buys a place next to the king. I cannot tell what heavens hath given him. Let some graver eye pierce into that, but I can see his pride peep through each part of him. Whence has he had, if not from hell? Why the devil, this devil upon this French going out, took ye upon him without the privity of the king? I appoint who should attend on him. He makes up the file of all the gentry, for the most part such to whom as great a change as little honor he meant to lay upon. And his own letter, the honorable board of counselor, must fetch him in it, he papers. I do know kinsmen of mine, three at the least, that have by this so sickened their estates that never they shall abound as formerly. Oh. Many have broke their backs with laying manners on them for this great journey. Grievingly, I think. The peace between the French and us not values the cost that did conclude it. Mary, it is a proper title of peace and purchased at a superfluous rate, which is butted out for France hath flawed the leak and hath attached our merchants good at Bordeaux. All this business our reverend carnal, cardinal carry. Like it, your grace, the state takes notice of the private difference twixt you and the cardinal. I advise you and take it from a heart that and plenteous he the cardinal's malice and his potency together to consider further that what his high hatred would affect once not a minister in his power you know his nature that he's revengeful and i know his sword hath a sharp edge it's long and may be said it reaches far and where twill not extend thither he darts it bosom up my counsel you'll find it wholesome lo where comes that rock that I advise your shunning. The Duke of Buckingham surveyor, huh? Where's his examination? Here, so please you. Is he in person ready? Aye, please your grace. Well, we shall then know more and Buckingham shall lessen his big look. I read in his looks matter against me, and his eye reviled me as his abject object. <clears throat> At this instant he bores me with some trick. He's gone to the king. I'll follow and outstare him. Stay, my lord, and let your reason with your collar question what tis you go about. To climb steep hills requires slow pace at first. Anger is like a full hot horse who, being allowed his way, self-metal tires him. Not a man in England can advise me like you. Be to yourself as you would to your friend. I'll to the king, and from a mouth of honor quite cry down this Ipswich fellow's insolence, or proclaim there's difference in no persons. Be advised, heat not a furnace for your foe so hot that it do singe yourself. You may outrun by violent swiftness that which we run at and lose by overrunning. Know you not the fire that mounts the liquor till, till it run over and seeming to augment it wastes it. Sir, I am thankful to you and I'll go along by your prescription. But this tough, proud fellow, whom from the flow of Gaul I name not, but for sincere motions by intelligence and proofs as clear as fonts in July, when we see each grain of gravel, I do know to be corrupt and treasonous. Say not treasonous. The king, I'll say. 
<laughs> and make my vouchers strong as shore of rock attend. This holy fox, or wolf, or both, for he was equal ravenous as he is subtle and as prone to mischief as able to perform it, his mind and place infecting one another, yet reciprocally only to show his pomp as well in France as here in home, suggests the king our master to his last costly treaty. This cardinal, the articles of the combination to us himself pleased, and they were ratified as he cried, thus let be, as to as much end as give a crutch to thy dead. But our count cardinal has done this, and it's well for worthy Wolsey, who cannot err, eh, he did it. Now this follows to the old damn treason. Charles the emperor under pretense to see the queen his aunt, which was indeed his color. But he came to whisper, Wolsey, here makes vexation. His fears were that the interview between England and France might, though their amity, breed him some prejudice. For from this league be arms that menaced him. Privily deeds will our cardinal, and as I throw, which I do well, for I am sure the emperor paid her his promise, whereby his suit was granted ere it was asked. But when the way was made and paved with gold, the emperor thus desired that he would please to alter the king's course and break the foresaid peace. Let the king know as soon he shall buy me that ducks this cardinal does buy and sell his honor as he pleases and for his own advantage. I am sorry to hear this of him and could wish he were something mistaken in it. No, not a syllable I do pronounce him in that very shape, he shall appear in proof. And to Brandon with papers and other officers. My Lord, the Duke of Buckingham and Earl of Hertford, Stafford and Northampton, I arrest thee of high treason in the name of our most sovereign King. Lo. You, my lord, the net has fallen upon me. I shall perish under device and practice. I am sorry to see you taken from liberty to look on the business present. Tis his highness' pleasure that you shall do the tower. My surveyor is false. The our great cardinal hath showed him gold. It will help me nothing to plead mine innocence, for that die is on me, which makes my will's part black. The will of heaven be done in this in all things. I obey. Oh, my Lord, my life is spent already. I am the shadow of poor Buckingham, whose figure even this instant clouds puts on by darkened ring my clear sun. My lord, farewell. Exeunt. Scene two, the same, the council chamber. Cornets enter King Henry the Eighth, leaning on the Wolsey's shoulder with nobles in attendance, including Cromwell. The cardinal places himself under the king's feet on his right side. My life itself and the best heart of it. Thanks you for this great care. I stood at the level of a full-charged confederacy and give thanks to you that choked it. Let us, let me call before us this dead gentleman of Buckingham's. In person, I'll hear him. His confessions justify, and point by point the treasons of his master he shall again relate. A noise within, crying, room for the queen. Enter Queen Catherine, ushered by the Duke of Norfolk. She kneels, King Henry riseth from his estate. Nay, we must longer kneel. I am a suitor. I am solicited not by a few, and those of true condition, that your subjects are in great grievance. 
There have been commissions sent down among them, which have flawed the heart of all their loyalties, wherein, although my good Lord Cardinal, they vent reproaches most bitterly on you as put her on of these exactions. Yet the king, our master, whose honor heaven shield from soil, even he escapes not language unmannerly. Yea, such which breaks the sides of loyalty and almost appears in loud rebellion. Not almost appears, it doth appear. For upon these taxations unfit for other life, compelled by hunger and lack of other means, in desperate manner, daring the event to the teeth, are all in uproar, and danger serves among them. Taxation? Wherein? What taxation? My lord cardinal, you are blamed for it alike with us. Know you of this taxation? No, please you, sir. I know but a single point in aught pertains to the state. And front but in that file where others tell steps with me. No, my lord. You know no more than others. These exactions whereof my sovereign would have note. They say they are devised by you or else you suffer too hard an exclamation. Still exaction, the nature of it. In what kind? Let's know is this exaction. The subject's heavy grief comes through commissions, which compels from each the sixth part of his substance to be levied without delay. And the pretense for this is named your wars in France. This makes bold mouths. Tongues spits their duties out, and cold hearts freeze allegiance in them. Their curses now live where their prayers did. And it comes to pass, this tractable obedience is a slave to each incensed will. I would, your highness, would give it quick consideration, for there is no primer basis. By my life, this is against our pleasure. And for me, I have no further gone in this than by a single voice. And that not passed by me, by learned approbation of the judges. If I am traduced by ignorant tongues, which neither know my faculties nor person, yet will be the chronicles of my doing, let me say tis but the fate of place and the rough break that virtues must go through. We must not stint our necessary actions in the fear to cope malicious censurers, which ever, as ravenous fishes, do a vessel follow that is newly trimmed, but benefit no further than vain, vainly longing. What we oft do best by sick interpreters, once weak ones, is not ours or not allowed. What worst as off hitting a grosser quality is cried up for our best act. If we shall stand still in fear, our motion will be mocked or carped at. We should take root here where we sit or sit state statues only. Things done well and with a care exempt themselves from fear. Things done without example in their issue are to be feared. Have you a precedent of this commission? I believe not any. We must not rend our subjects from our laws and stick them in our will. Sixth part of each, a trembling contribution. Why we take from every treetop, bark, and part of the timber, though we leave it with a root thus hacked, the air will drink the sap. To every county where this is questioned, send our letters with free pardon to each man has, that has denied the force of this commission. Pray look to it. I put it to your care. Wolsey pulls Cromwell aside. A word with you. Let there be letters written to every shire that through our intercession, this revocement and pardon comes. I shall anon advise you further in the proceeding. Exit Cromwell, enter Buckingham's surveyor. I'm sorry that the Duke of Buckingham is run in your displeasure. It grieves many. The gentleman is learned and a most rare speaker. To nature none more bound. 
has training such that he may furnish and instruct great teachers and never seek for aid out of himself. Yet see, when these so noble benefits shall prove not well disposed, the mind growing once corrupt, they turn to vicious forms, ten times more ugly than they were ever fair. This man, my lady, hath unto monstrous habits put the graces that once were his, and is become as black as besmeared in hell. Sit by us, you shall hear. That was this gentleman in trust of him things to strike honor sad. Bid him recount the four recited practices, whereof we cannot feel too little or hear too much. Stand forth and with bold spirit relate what you most like a careful subject have collected out of the Duke of Buckingham. Speak freely. First, it was usual with him. Every day it would inflect his speech that if uh, that, that if the king should die, should without issue die, he'll carry it so to make the scepter his. These very words I've heard him utter to his son-in-law, Lord uh, Abergavenny, uh, to whom by oath he menaced revenge upon the cardinal. Please, your highness, note this dangerous conception in this point. Not friended by his wish to your high person, his will is most malignant, and it stretches beyond you to your friends. My learned Lord Cardinal, deliver all with charity. Speak on how grounded he is entitled to the crown upon our fail. To this point hast thou heard him at any time speak aught? He was brought to this by a vain prophecy of a Chartreuse friar, his confessor, who fed him every minute with words of sovereignty. How knowest thou this? Not long before your highness sped to France, the, the duke, being at the Rose, did of me demand what was the speech among the Londoners confirming, concerning the French journey. I replied, men fear the French would prove perfidious to the king's danger. Presently, the duke said twas the fear indeed, and, and that he doubted twould prove the verity of certain words spoke by a, a holy monk that oft, says he, hath sent to me, wishing me to permit John de la Car, my chaplain, a choice hour to hear from him a matter of some moment, whom, un after under the confession seal, he solemnly had sworn that what he spoke, my chaplain to no creature living, but to me should utter with demure confidence, this pausingly ensued. Neither the king nor his heirs to tell you the duke shall prosper. Bid him strive to gain the love of the commonality. The duke shall govern England. If I know you well, you were the Duke Surveyor and lost your office on the complaint of the tenants. Take good heed, your charge not in your spleen, a noble person, and spoil your noble soul. I say, take heed, beseech you. On my soul, I'll speak but truth. I told my Lord the Duke, by the devil's illusions, the monk might be deceived, and that was dis and that was dangerous for him to ruminate on this so far until it forged him some design, which, being believed, it was much like to do. He answered, "Hush! It can do me no damage." What? So rank? There's mischief in this man. But on, what hence? If quoth he, I for this had been committed as to the tower, I thought. I would have played the part my father meant to act upon, the usurper Richard, who, being at Salisbury, made suit to come in his presence, which, if granted, as he made semblance of his duty, would have put his knife into him. Giant traitor! Now, Adam, may his highness live in freedom, and this man out of prison... God, Mendel. 
There's something more wood out of thee. What sayest? After the duke, his father, with the knife, he stretched him, and with one hand on his dagger, another spread on his breast, mounting his eyes, he did discharge a horrible oath whose tenor was, were he evil news, he would outgo his father by as much as a performance does an irresolute purpose. There's his period. To sheath his knife in us? He is attached. Call him to present trial. If he may find mercy in the law, tis his. If none, let him seek to us. By day and night, he's traitor. Exeunt. Scene three. An antechamber in the palace. Enter Lord Chamberlain and Duke of Suffolk. Is it possible the spells of France should juggle men into such strange mysteries? Uh, new customs, though they be never so ridiculous, nay, let them be unmanly, yet are followed. As far as I see, all the good our English have got by the late voyage is but merely a fit or two of the face. But they are shrewd ones. <laughs> they have all new legs and lame ones. One would take it that in their never seen pace before that the spaven or the spinghalt reigned among them. <laughs> uh, their clothes are after such a pagan cut to it that sure they've worn out Christendom. Enter Sir Thomas Lovell. How now? What news, Sir Thomas Lovell? Faith, my lord, I hear of none but the new proclamation that's clapped upon the court gate. What is it for? The reformation of our... Fill the court with quarrels, talk, and tailors. <laughs> I'm glad tis there. Now I would pray our messieurs to think an English courtier may be wise and never see the Louvre. <laughs> they must either, for so run the conditions. Leave those remnants of fool and feather that they got in France, with all their honorable point of ignorance pertaining thereunto as fights and fireworks, abusing better men than they can be out of a foreign wisdom, renouncing clean the faith they have in tennis and tall stockings, <laughs> short blistered breeches, <laughs> and those types of travel, and understand again like honest men, or pack to their old playfellow. Our ladies will have a loss of these trim vanities. <laughs> uh, sons have got to sound ladies. A French song and a fiddle has no fellow. <laughs> <laughs> well said, Sir Thomas. Uh, whither were you going? To the Cardinals. Your lord is a your lordship is a guest too. Oh, tis true. This night he makes a supper and a great one. To many lords and ladies, there will be the beauty of this kingdom, I assure you. That churchman bears a bounteous mind indeed. A hand as fruitful as the land that feeds us. His dues fall everywhere. Uh, no doubt he's noble. He had a black mouth that said other of him. <laughs> he may, my lord, has wherewithal in him sparing should show a worse sin than ill doctrine. Uh, men of his way should be most liberal. They are sent here for examples. Ah, true, they are so. But few now give so great ones. My barge stays. Your lordship shall along. Come, good Sir Thomas. We shall be late else. I am your lordships. Exeunt. Scene four. A hall in York Palace. Hot boys. A small table under a state for the cardinal, a longer table for the guests. Then enter Anne Boleyn and divers. Other ladies and gentlemen as guests at one door, then at another door, enter Chamberlain, Suffolk, and Lovell. Uh, Sir Thomas Lovell, at the cardinal but half my lay thoughts in him. <laughs> Some of these should find a running banquet ere they rested. I think would better please him <laughs> by my life. They are a sweet society of fair ones. Oh, that your lordship were, were but now confessor to one or two of these. Mm, I would I were. 
they should find easy penance. <laughs> Faith, how easy? As easy as a down bed would afford it. Sweet ladies, will it please you sit? Uh, Sir Thomas, place you that side. I'll take the charge of this. The guests are seated. His grace is entering. Lord of Suffolk, you pray sit between these ladies. <laughs> By my faith, and thank your lordship. By your leave, sweet ladies. He sits between Anne and another lady. So, now you're fairly seated, gentlemen. The penance lies on you if these fair ladies pass away frowning. Hot boys, enter Wolsey with attendants and servants and takes his state. You're welcome, my fair guest. That noble lady or gentleman that is not freely married is not my friend. This to confirm my welcome and to you all good health. He drinks to them. Why, how now, dear? Ladies, you are not merry, gentlemen. Whose fault is this? Oh, the red wine must first rise in their fair cheeks, my lord. Then shall we have them talk to us, talk us to silence. <laughs> you are a merry gamester, my lord Suffolk. Yes, if I may my play. Here's to your ladyship. I pledge it, madam. Hmm. For tis to such a thing... You cannot show me. <laughs> I told your grace they would talk soon and on. <laughs> Drum and trumpet, chamber is discharged. What's that? Look out there, some of you. What warlike voice, and to what end is this? Nay, ladies, fear not. By all the laws of war, you're privileged. We enter servants. How now? What is't? A noble troop of strangers, for so they seem. They've left their barge and landed, and hither make as great ambassadors from foreign princes. Good Lord Chamberlain, go. Give them welcome. You can speak the French tongue. And pray receive him nobly and conduct him into our presence, where this heaven of beauty shall shine at full upon them. Some, attend him. Exit Chamberlain with attendance. All rise and tables removed. You have now a broken banquet, but we'll mend it. A good digestion to you all. And once more, I shower a welcome on you. Welcome all. Hot boys enter King Henry and others as maskers, habited like shepherds, ushered by Chamberlain. They pass directly before Wolsey and gracefully salute him. A noble company. What are their pleasures? Chamberlain. Uh, um, uh, because they speak no English, they thus they prayed to tell your grace that, having heard by fame of this so noble and so fair assembly this night to meet here, uh, they could do no less out of the great respect they bear to beauty, but leave their flocks and, under your fair conduct, crave leave, the, leave to view these ladies and entreat an hour of revels with them. Say, Lord Chamberlain, they have done my poor house grace, for which I pay them a thousand thanks, and pray them take their pleasures. The maskers choose ladies. King Henry chooses Anne Boleyn. The fairest hand I ever touched. Oh, beauty, till now I never knew thee. Music, dance. Uh, my lord, your grace, pray tell him thus much from me. There should be amongst them by his person more worthy this place than myself, to whom, if I but knew him, with my love and duty, I would surrender it. Uh, I will, my lord. Chamberlain whisper with the maskers, then return. What say? Are they? 
A such a one they all confess there is indeed, which they would have your grace find out, and he will take it. Let me see then. He leaves his state. By all your good by all your good leaves, gentlemen. He bows before King Henry. Here I'll make my royal choice. King Henry unmasks. You have found him, Cardinal. <laughs> All the fair assembly. You do well, Lord. You are a churchman, or I'll tell you, Cardinal, I should judge now unhappily. Oh, I am glad your grace has grown so pleasant. My Lord Chamberlain, prithee, <laughs> come hither. What fair lady is that? And it please your grace, Sir Thomas Bolin's daughter, the Vicomte Rochefort, one of Her Highness's women. By heaven, she is a dainty one. Sweetheart, I were manly to take you out and not to kiss you. He kisses Anne. A health, gentlemen, let it go round. He drinks a toast. Sir Thomas Lovell, is the banquet ready in the privy chamber? Yes, my lord. Your grace, I fear, with dancing is a little heated. I fear too much. There's fresher air, my lord, in the next chamber. Oh, lead in your ladies, every one. Sweet partner, I must not yet forsake you. Let's be merry, good my lord cardinal. I only have a half a dozen healths to drink to these fair, fair ladies, and a measure to lead them once again. And then let's dream who's best in favor. Let the music knock it. Exeunt with trumpets. Ba -ba -da -ba -da. Act two, scene one, Westminster, a street. Enter first and second gentlemen at several doors. Whither away so fast? Oh, God save you, even to the hall to hear what shall become of the great Duke of Buckingham. I'll save you that labor, sir. All's now done but the ceremony of bringing back the prisoner. Were you there? Yes, indeed I was. Pray speak, what has happened? Is he found guilty? Yes, truly, he is, and condemned upon it. Oh, I'm sorry for it. So are a number more. But pray, how passed it? The great duke came to the bar, where to his accusations he pleaded still not guilty, and alleged many sharp reasons to, def to defeat the law. The king's attorney, on the contrary, urged on the examination proofs confessions of diverse witnesses, which the duke desired to him brought viva voce to his face, and which appeared against him his surveyor, Sir Gilbert Peck, his counselor, and John Carr, confessor to him, with that devil monk, Hopkins, that made this mischief. That was he that fed him with his prophecies. The same. All these accused him strongly, which he fain would have flung from him, but indeed he could not. And so his peers, upon this evidence, have found him guilty of high treason. Much he spoke and learnedly for life, but all was either pitied in him or forgotten. I do not think he fears death. Sure he does not. He never was so womanish, the cause he may a little grieve at. Certainly the cardinal is the end of this. Tis likely. Earl Surrey was sent thither, and in haste too, lest he should help his father. This is noted, and generally, whoever the king favors the Cardinal instantly will find employment, and far enough from court, too. All the commons hate him perniciously, and of my conscience wish him ten fathom deep. This duke, as much as they love and dote on, call him bounteous Buckingham, the mirror of all courtesy. Stay there, sir, and see the noble ruined man you speak of. Enter Buckingham from his arraignment, with officers, with halberds on each side, accompanied with Lovell, the lords and commoners. Let's stand close and behold him. All good people, you that thus far have come to pity me, I have this day received a traitor's judgment, and by that name must die. 
Yet heaven bears witness, and if I have conscience, let it sink me even as the axe falls. If I be not faithful, the law I bear no malice for my death, it has done upon the premises, but justice, but those that sought us, I could wish more Christian be what they will. I heartily forgive them. Yet let them lock thy glory not in mischief, nor build their evils in the graves of great men, for then my guiltless blood must cry against them. For further life in this world I ne'er hope, nor will I sue, although the king have mercies more than I dare make false. You few that love me go with me like good angels to my end. And as the long divorce of steel falls on me, make of your prayers one sweet sacrifice and lift my soul to heaven. Lead on a God's name. I do beseech your grace for charity. If ever any malice in your heart were hid against me, now to forgive me frankly, to the waterside I must conduct your grace. The Duke is coming. See the barge be ready, ready, and fit it with such furniture as suits the greatness of his person. Nay, Sir Thomas, let it alone. My state now will but mock me. When I came hither, I was Lord High Constable and Duke of Buckingham. Now, or Edward Bone. Yet I am richer than my base accusers that never knew what truth meant. I now seal it, and with that blood will make them one day groan for it. Heaven have an end in all. Yet you that hear me this from a dying man receive a certain where you are liberal of your loves and counsels. Be sure you are not loose. For those you make friends and give your hearts to, when they once perceive the least rub in your false fortunes, fall away like waters from you, never found again, but were they meant to sink you. All good people pray for me. I must now go sit. The last hour of my long, weary life has come upon me. Farewell, and when you would say something that is said, speak how I fell. I have done, and God forgive me. Exit Lovell with Buckingham and Train. Oh, this is full of pity, sir. It calls, I fear, too many curses on their heads that were the authors. I can give you inkling of an ensuing evil if it fall greater than this. The secret is so weighty, twill require a strong faith to conceal it. Let me have it. I do not talk much. You shall, sir. Did you not of late days hear a buzzing of a separation between the king and Catherine? Yes, but it held not. For when the king once heard it, out of anger he sent command to the Lord Mayor straight to stop the rumor and ally those tongues that durst dispense it. But that slander, sir, has found a truth now, for it grows again fresher than e'er it was, and held for certain the king will venture at it. Either the cardinal or some about him near have, out of malice to the good queen, possessed him with a scruple that will endure her. To confirm this, too, Cardinal Campius is arrived, and lately, as all think, for this business. This is the Cardinal, and merely to revenge him on the Emperor for not bestowing on him at his asking the Archbishopric of Toledo. This is purposed. I think you have hit the mark, but it's not cruel that she should feel the smart of this. The Cardinal will have his will, and she must fall. Tis woeful. We are too open here to argue this. Uh, let's let's think it private more. Exeunt. Scene two, an antechamber in the palace. Enter Chamberlain, reading a letter. Uh, my lord, the horses your lordship sent 
for with all the care I had, I saw well chosen, ridden and furnished. They were young and handsome and of the best breed in the North. When they were ready to set out for London, a man of my Lord Cardinal's by commission and main power took him from me with this reason, his master would be served before a subject, if not before the king, which stopped our mouth, sir. I fear he will indeed. Well, let him have them. He will have all, I think. Enter Norfolk and Suffolk. Hmm. Well met, my Lord Chamberlain. A good day to both your graces. How is the king employed? I left him private, full of sad thoughts and troubles. What's the cause? <laughs> it seems the marriage with his brother's wife has crept too near his conscience. No, his conscience has crept too near another lady. <laughs> this is the cardinal's doing, the king cardinal. How holily he works in all his business and with what zeal. For now he has cracked the league between us and the emperor, the queen's great nephew. He dives into the king's soul and there scatters danger, <laughs> doubts, wringing of the conscience, fears and despairs. And all these for his marriage. And out of all of, all of these to restore the king, he counsels a divorce, a loss of her that like a jewel has hung 20 years about his neck yet never lost her luster of her that loves him with that excellence that angels love good men with even of her that with the greatest stroke of fortune falls will bless the king and is not this heaven course keep me pious. from such counsel it is most true these news are everywhere every tongue speaks them and every true heart weeps for it all that dare look into these affairs, see this main end, the French king's sister. Heaven will one day open the king's eyes that so long have slept upon this bold bad man. As for me, my lords, I love him not, nor fear him. There's my creed. As I am made without him, so I'll stand. If the king please. <laughs> his curses and his blessings touch me alike. Their breath I not believe in. I knew him and I know him not. I know him. So I leave him to him that made him proud. The Pope. <laughs> Let's in. And with some other business put the king from these sad thoughts that work too much upon him. My lord, you'll bear us company. Uh, excuse me, the king has sent me otherwhere. Uh, besides, you'll find a most unfit time to disturb him. Health to your lordships. Thanks, my lord chamberlain. Exit chamberlain. King Henry draws the curtain and sits reading pensively. How sad he looks. Sure, he is much afflicted. Pray God he be not angry. There I say. How dare you thrust yourselves into my private meditations? Who am I? Ah! A gracious king that pardons all offenses, malice never meant. Our breach of duty this way is business of a state in which we come to know your royal pleasure. You are too bold. Go to. I'll make you know your times of business. Is this an hour for temporal affairs? Ha! Enter Wolsey and Cardinal Campius with a commission. Who's there? Ah, my good Lord Cardinal. Oh, my Wolsey. The quiet of my wounded conscience thou art a cure, fit for a king. You are welcome, most learned reverend, sir, into our kingdom. Use us and it. Would your grace would give us but an hour of private conference? We are busy. Go. This cannot continue. Exit Norfolk and Suffolk. Rome, nurse of judgment, invited by your noble self, hath sent one general tongue unto us. This good man, this just and learned priest, Cardinal Campius, 
who, whom once more I present unto your highness. And once more in mine arms I bid him welcome and thank the Holy Conclave for their loves. They have sent me such a man as I would have wished for. He embraces Campius. Campius hands him a paper. I tender my commission by whose virtue the court of Rome commanding you, my Lord Cardinal of York, are joined with me, their servant, in the unpartial judging of this business. Two equal men, the queen shall be acquainted forthwith with for what you come. Where's Gardner? I know your majesty has always loved her so dear in heart, not to deny her that a woman of less place might ask by law. Scholars allowed freely to argue for her. I and the best she shall have, and my favor to him that does best. God forbid else, Cardinal. Prithee call Gardner to me, my new secretary. I'll find him a fit fellow. Wolsey goes to the door. Enter Gardner to Wolsey. Give me your hand. Much joy and favor to you. You are the kings now. But to be commanded forever by your grace, whose hand has raised me. Come hither, Gardner. King Henry and Gardner walk and whisper. My lord of York, was not one Dr. Pace in this man's place before him? Yes, he was. Was he not held a learned man? Yes, surely. Believe me, there's an ill opinion spread then, even of yourself, Lord Cardinal. How? Of me? They will not stick to say you envied him, and fearing he would rise, he was so virtuous, kept him a foreign man still, so grieved him that he ran mad and died. Hmm. Heaven's peace be with him. That's Christian care enough. For living murmurers... His places of rebuke. He was a fool, for he would needs be virtuous. That good fellow, if I command him, follows my appointment. I will have none so near else. Learn this, brother. We live not to be griped by demeanor persons. Deliver this with modesty to the queen. Exit Gardner. The most convenient place that I can think of for such receipt of learning is Blackfriars. There you shall meet about this weighty business, Miss my Wolsey. See it furnished. Oh, my lord, would it not grieve an able man to leave so sweet a better fellow? But conscience, conscience, oh, tis a tender place, and I must leave her. Exeunt. Scene three, an antechamber in the queen's apartments. Enter Anne Boleyn and an old lady in conversation. Not for that neither. Here's the pang that pinches. His Highness, having lived so long with her, and she, so good a lady that no tongue could ever pronounce dishonor on her, by my life she never knew harm doing. Oh, now, after so many courses of the sun enthroned, still growing in majesty and pomp, the witch to leave a thousandfold more bitter than tis sweet at first to acquire, after this process, to give her the avaunt? It is a pity would move a monster. Alas, poor lady, she is a stranger now again. So much the more must pity drop upon her. Verily, I swear, tis better to be lowly born and ranged with humble livers and content than to be perked up in a glistering grief and wear a golden sorrow. Our content is our best having. By my troth and maidenhead, I would not be a queen. Beshrew me, I would, and venture maidenhead too for it, and so would you, for all this spice of your hypocrisy, you that have so fair parts of woman on you, have too a woman's heart, which ever yet affected eminence, wealth, sovereignty, which to say sooth are blessings, and which gifts saving your mincing the capacity of your soft several conscience would receive if you might please to stretch it nay good truth yes truth and truth 
You would not be queen? No, not for all the riches under heaven. <laughs> what think you of a duchess? Have you limbs to bear that load of title? No, in truth. <laughs> then you are weakly made. Pluck off a little. I would not be a young count in your way for more than blushing comes to. If your back cannot vouchsafe this burden, tis too weak ever to get a boy. Enter Chamberlain. Ah, uh, good morrow, ladies. What were it worth to know the secret of your conference? My good lord, not your demand. It values not your asking. Our mistress's sorrows we were pitying. Ah, uh, it was a gentle business and becoming the action of good women. There is hope. All will be well. Now I pray God, amen. Ah, uh, you bear a gentle mind, and heavenly blessings follow such creatures that you may, fair lady, perceive I speak sincerely, and high notes taken of your many virtues. The king's majesty commends his good opinion of you to you, and does purpose honor to you no less flowing than Marchioness of Pembroke, to which title a thousand pound a year annual support out of his grace, he adds. I do not know what kind of my obedience I should tender. More than my all is nothing. Nor my prayers are not words duly hallowed, nor my wishes more worth than empty vanities. Yet prayers and wishes are all I can return. I beseech your lordship, vouchsafe to speak my thanks and my obedience as from a blushing handmaid to his highness, whose health and royalty I pray for. Lady, I shall not fail to approve the fair conceit the king hath of you. I have perused her will. Beauty and honor in her are so mingled that they have caught the king. And who knows yet but from this lady may proceed a gem to lighten all this isle. I'll to the king and say I spoke with you. My honored lord. Exit Chamberlain. Why, this is it. See, see, I have been begging 16 years in court, and yet a courtier beggarly, nor could come pat betwixt too early and too late for any suit of pounds. And you, oh, fate, a very fresh fish here. Fie, fie, fie upon this compelled fortune. Have your mouth filled up before you open it. This is strange to me. How tastes it? Is it bitter? Oh, come, you are pleasant. <laughs> With your theme, I could o'ermount the lark. The Marconess of Pembroke, hmm? A thousand pounds a year for pure respect. No other obligation. By my life, that promises more thousands. Honor's train is longer than his foreskirt. By this time, I know your back will bear a duchess. Say, are you not stronger than you were? Good lady, make yourself mirth with your particular fancy and leave me out on it. But I had no being if the salute my blood a jot. It faints me to think what follows. The queen is comfortless, and we forgetful in our long absence. Pray, do not deliver what you've heard to her. What do you think of me? Exeunt. Scene four, a hall in Black Friars. Trumpets, Senate, and Cornets. First, enter in pomp the court staff, vergers, scribes, sergeant-at-arms, etc. Then enter a group of bishops and priests bearing a silver cross. After them, Cardinal Wolsey and Cardinal Campius. Then King Henry enters with his train, including Cranmer. The king takes place under the cloth of state. The cardinals sit under him as judges. Then enter Queen Catherine and her attendants. The queen takes place at some distance from the king. The bishops place themselves on each side of the court in matter of consistory. Below them, the scribes, the lords, sit next to the bishops. The rest of the attendants stand in convenient order about the stage. Let silence be commended. We shall proceed. Say, Henry, King of England, come into the court. Henry, King of England, come into the court. 
say, Catherine, Queen of England, come into the court. Queen Catherine makes no answer, rises out of her chair, goes about the court, comes to King Henry, and kneels at his feet, then speaks. Sir, I desire you not, I desire you do me right and justice, and to bestow your pity on me. For I am a most poor woman and a stranger, born out of your dominions, having here no judge indifferent, nor no more assurance of equal friendship and proceeding. Alas, sir, in what have I offended you? What cause hath my behavior given to your displeasure, that thus you should proceed to put me off and take your good grace from me? Heaven witness, I have been to you a true and humble wife, at all times to you, your will comfortable, ever in fear to kindle your dislike, yea, subject to your countenance, glad or sorry, as I saw it inclined. When was the hour I ever contradicted your desire, or made it not mine too? Or which of your friends have I not strove to love, although I knew he were mine enemy? What friend of mine that had to him derived your anger did I continue in my liking? Nay, give notice, he was from thence discharged. Sir, call to mind that I have been your wife in this obedience upward of 20 years and have been blessed with many children by you. If in the course and process of this time you can report and prove it too against mine honor ought my bond to wedlock or my love and duty against your sacred person in god's name turn me away and let the foulest contempt shut door upon me and so give me up to the sharpest kind of justice please you sir the king your father was reputed for a prince most prudent of an excellent and unmatched wit and judgment. Further than my father, king of Spain, was reckoned one the wisest prince that there had reigned by many a year before. It is not to be questioned that they had gathered a wise counsel to them of every realm that did debate this business, who deemed our marriage lawful. Wherefore, I humbly beseech you, sir, to spare me till I may be by my friends in Spain advised, whose counsel I will implore, if not, in the name of God, your pleasure be fulfilled. You have here, lady, and of your choice, these reverend fathers, men of singular integrity and learning, yea, the elect of the land, who are assembled to plead your cause. Therefore, madam, it's fit this royal session do proceed, and that without delay their arguments be now produced and heard. Lord Cardinal, to you I speak. Your pleasure, madam. Sir, I am about to weep, but thinking that we are a queen, or long have dreamed so, certain the daughter of a king, my drops of tears I'll turn to sparks of fire. Be patient yet. I will, when you are humble. Do I do believe, induced by potent circumstances, that you are mine enemy and make my challenge. You shall not be my judge, for it is you have blown this coal betwixt my lord and me, which gods do quench. Therefore I say again, I utterly abhor, yea, from my soul, refuse you for my judge, whom yet once more I hold my most malicious foe, and think not at all a friend to truth. Madam, you do me wrong. I have no spleen against you, nor injustice for you or any. How far I have proceeded, or how far, how far further shall, is warranted by a commission from the consistory. Yea, the whole consistory of Rome. You charge me that I have blown this coal. I do deny it. The king is present. 
If it be known to him that I gainsay my deed, how may he wound and worthily my falsehood? Yea, as much as you have done my truth. If he knows that I am free of your report, he knows I am not of your wrong. Therefore to him it lies to cure me, and the cure is to remove these thoughts from you, to which before his highness shall speak in, I do beseech you, gracious madam, to unthink your speaking and to say no more. My lord, my lord, I am a simple woman, much too weak to oppose your cunning, your meek and humbled mouth, you sign your place and calling in full seeming with meekness and humility, but your heart is crammed with arrogancy, spleen and pride. You have by fortune and his highness's favors gone slightly o'er low steps, and now are mounted where powers are your retainers, and your words domestics to you serve your will as to please yourself, pronounce their office. I must tell you, you tender more your person's honor than your high profession spiritual. That again I do refuse you for my judge. And here, before you all, appeal unto the Pope to bring my whole cause afore his holiness and to be judged by him. She curtsies to the king and offers to depart. Being is obstinate, stubborn to justice, apt to accuse it and disdainful to be tried by it. Tis not well. She's going away. Call her again. Catherine, Queen of England, come into the court. You vex me past my pleasure, patience. Pray you, pass on. I will not tarry. No, nor evermore upon this business my appearance make in any of their courts. Exit Queen Catherine and her attendants. Go oh, thy ways, Kate. That man I in the world who shall report, he has a better wife, let him in naught be trusted for speaking false in that. Thou art alone, if thy rare qualities, sweet gentleness, thy meekness, saint-like, wife-like government, obeying, commanding, and thy part, sovereign and pious else, could speak thee out. The queen of earthly queens. She is noble born, and like her true nobility, she has carried herself towards me. Most gracious sir, in humblest manner, I require your high highness that it shall please you to declare in hearing of all these ears, whether ever that I did broach this business to your highness or laid any scruple in your way which might induce you to the question on it, or ever have you, but with thanks to God for such a royal lady, spake one the least word that might be to the prejudice of her present state or touch of her good person. My Lord Cardinal, I do excuse you. And up, upon mine honor, I free you from it. You are not to be taught that you may have many any enemies that know not why they are so, but like to village curs, bark when their fellows do. By some of these, the queen is put in anger. You're excused. But will you be more justified? On my honor, I speak, my good Lord Cardinal, to this point and thus far clear him. Now, what moved me to it? I will be bold with time and your attention, then mark the inducement. Thus it came, give heed to it. My conscience first received a tenderness, scruple and prick on certain speeches uttered by the Bishop of Bayonne, then French ambassador, who has been sent hither on the debating a marriage between the Duke of Orleans and our daughter Mary. In the progress of this business, Ere a determinate resolution, he, I, I mean the bishop, did require a respite whether our daughter were legitimate, respecting this our marriage with the dowager, sometimes our brother's wife. This respite shook the bosom of my conscience, entered me, yea, with a spitting power, and made to tremble the region of my breast, 
First, we thought that I stood not in the smile of heaven, who had commanded nature that my lady's womb, if it conceived a male child by me, should do more offices of life than to, to it than the grave does to the dead. For her male issue or died when they were made, or shortly after this world had aired them. Hence, I took a thought that was judgment on me. Then follows that I weighed the danger which my realm stood in, in by this my issues fail. Thus howling in the wild sea of my conscience, I did steer toward this remedy, whereupon we are now present here together. That's to say, I meant to rectify my conscience, which I then did feel full sick and yet not well by all the reverend fathers of the land and doctors learned. Unsolicited, I left no reverend person in this court, but by particular consent proceeded under holy hands and seals. Therefore go on for no dislike of the world against the person of the good queen, but the sharp thorny points of my alleged reasons drives this forward. Prove but our marriage lawful by my life in kingly dignity, we are contented to wear our mortal state to come with her, Catherine, our queen, before the primest creature that's paragon of the world. So please, your grace, the queen being absent, tis a needful fitness that we adjourn the court till further day. Meanwhile, must be an earnest motion made to the queen to call back her appeal she attends unto his holiness. I may perceive these cardinals trifle with me. I abhor the dilatory sloth and tricks of Rome. My learned and well-beloved Cranmer, servant Cranmer, prithee, return. With thy approach, I know my comfort comes along. Break up the court, I say, set on. Exeunt in manner as they entered. Act three, scene one, London, Queen Catherine's apartments, Queen Catherine and her ladies were. Orpheus with his lute makes trees and the mountain tops that freeze bow themselves when he did sing to his music plants and flowers ever spring as sun and showers there had made a lasting spring. Everything that heard him play, even the billows of the sea, hung their heads and then lay by. In sweet music is such art, killing care and grief of heart, fall asleep or hearing die. Enter gentlemen. How now? Uh, uh, hey, please, your grace, the two great cardinals wait in the presence. Would they speak with me? Oh, they wilt me say so, madam. Pray their graces to come near. Uh, Exit, gentlemen. Oh, what can their business with me, a poor weak woman fallen from favor? I do not like their coming, now I think on it. They should be good men, their affairs are as righteous, but all hoods make not monks. <laughs> Enter the two cardinals, Wolsey and Campius. Peace to your highness. What are your pleasures with me, reverend lords? May it please you, noble madam, to withdraw into your private chamber. We shall give you the full cause of our coming. If your business seek me out, and that way I am wife in, out with it boldly. Truth loves open dealing. Tanta esterga te mentis in integriatus regina uh, serenissima. Good, my lord, no Latin. A strange tongue makes my cause more strange, suspicious. Pray, speak in English. Here are some will thank you. If you speak truth for their poor mistress's sake. Believe me, she has had much wrong. Lord Cardinal, the willingness sin I ever committed may be absolved in English. Noble lady, I am sorry my integrity should breed and service to his majesty and you so deep suspicion where all faith was meant 
we come not by the way of accusation to taint the honor every good tongue blesses, nor to betray you any way to sorrow. Now you have too much, good lady, but to know how you stand minded in the weighty difference between the king and you, and to deliver, like free and honest men, our just opinions and comforts to your cause. Most honored madam, my lord of York, out of his noble nature, zeal, and obedience, he still bore your grace, forgetting, like a good man, your late censure, both of his truth and him, which was too far, offers as I do, in a sign of peace, his service and his counsel. To betray me. My lords, I thank you both for your good wills. You speak like honest men. Pray God you prove so. But now, to make you suddenly an answer in such a point of weight, so near mine honor, more near my life, I fear. Good, your graces, let me have time and counsel for my cause. Alas, I am a woman, friendless, hopeless. Madam, you've wronged the king's love with these fears. Your hopes and friends are infinite. In England, but little for my profit. Can you think, lords, that any Englishman dare give me counsel, or be a known friend against his highness's pleasure, though he be grown so desperate to be honest and live a subject? Nay, forsooth, my friends, they that must weigh out my afflictions, they that my trust must grow to live not here. They are, as all my other comforts, far hence in mine own country, lords. I would your grace would leave your griefs and take my counsel. How, sir? Put your main cause into the king's protection. He's loving and most gracious. T'will be much both for your honor better and your cause. For if the trial of the law were take you, you'll part away disgraced. He tells you rightly. You tell me what you wish for both. My ruin. Is this your Christian counsel? Out upon you. Heaven is above all yet. There sits a judge that no king can corrupt. Your rage mistakes us. The more shame for you, holy men I thought you. Upon my soul, two reverend cardinals' virtues, but cardinal sins and hollow hearts I fear you. Mend them for shame, my lords. Is this your comfort? The cordial that you bring a wretched lady, a woman lost among you, laughed at, scorned? I will not wish you half my miseries. I have more charity, but say I warned you, take heed, for heaven's sake, take heed, lest at once the burden of my sorrows fall upon you. No, madam, this is a mere distraction. You turn the good we offer into envy. You turn me into nothing. Woe upon you and all such false professors. Would you have me? If you have any justice, any pity, if you be anything but churchman's habits, put my sick cause into his hands that hates me? Alas, has banished me his bed already? His love too long ago. I am old, my lords, and all the fellowship I hold now with him is only my obedience. What can happen to me above this wretchedness? Your fears are worse. Have I lived thus long a wife, a true one, a woman, I dare say, without vainglory, never yet branded with suspicion? Have I, with all my full affections, still met the king, loved him next heaven, obeyed him, been out of fondness superstitious to him, almost forgot my prayers to content him? And am I thus rewarded? Tis not well, lords. Bring me a constant woman to her husband, one that ne'er dreamed a joy beyond his pleasure. And to that woman, when she has done most, yet will I add an honor, a great patience. 
Madam, you wander from the good we aim at. My lord, I dare not make myself so guilty to give up willingly that noble title your master wed me to. Nothing but death shall e'er divorce my dignities. If your grace could be but brought to know our ends are honest, you'd feel more comfort. Why should we, good lady, upon what cause wrong you? Alas, our places, the way of our profession, is against it. We are to cure such sorrows, not to sow them. Oh, for goodness sake, consider what you do, how you may hurt yourself. I utterly grow from the king's acquaintance by this carriage. The hearts of princes kiss obedience so much they love it. But two stubborn spirits, they swell and grow as terrible as storms. I know you have a gentle, noble temper, a soul as even as as calm. Pray think us those we profess, peacemakers, friends, and servants. Madam, you'll find it so. You wrong your virtues with these weak women's fears. Noble spirit as yours was put into you, ever cast such doubts as false coin from it. The king loves you, beware you lose it not. For us, if you please to trust us in your business, we are ready to use our utmost studies in your service. Do what you will, my lords, and pray forgive me if I have used myself unmannerly. You know I am a woman lacking wit to make a seemly answer to such persons. Pray, do my service to his majesty. He has my heart yet and shall have my prayers while I shall have my life. Come, Reverend Fathers, bestow your counsels on me. She now begs that little thought. When she set footing here, she should have bought her dignity so dear. Exeunt. <clears throat> Scene two, antechamber to King Henry's, King Henry VIII's apartments. Enter Norfolk, Suffolk, Chamberlain, and the Earl of Surrey. If you, will, if you will now unite in your complaints and force them with their constancy, the Cardinal cannot stand under them. I am joyful to meet the least occasion that may give me remembrance of my father-in-law, the Duke, to be revenged on him. Which of the peers have uncontaminated gone by him, or at least strangely neglected? When did he regard the stamp of nobleness in any person out of himself? My lords, you speak your pleasures. What he deserves of you and me, I know. What we can do to him, though now the time gives way to us, I much fear. If you cannot bar his access to the king, never attempt anything on him, for he hath a witchcraft over the king in his tongue. Oh, fear him not. His spell in that is out. The king hath found matter against him things are all unfolded wherein he appears as I would wish mine enemy how came his practices to light mm -hmm. must most strangely the cardinal's letters to the Pope miscarried and came to the eye of the king therein he was read how that the cardinal did entreat his holiness to stay the judgment of the divorce. For if it did take place, I do, quoth he, perceive my king is tangled in affection to a creature of the queen's, Lady Anne Boleyn. Has the king this? I believe it. Will this work? The king in this perceives him how he, co how he coasts and hedges his own way. But in this point, all his tricks founder, and he brings his physic after his, pa after his patient's death. The king already hath married the fair lady. Now all my joy, there's order given for her coronation. Mary, this is yet but young, and may be left to some ears unrecounted, but 
my lords, she is a gallant creature and complete in mind and feature. I persuade me from, from her will fall some blessing to this land which shall in it be memorized. But will the king digest this letter of the cardinals? The Lord forbid. Mary, amen. No, no. There be more wasps that buzz about his nose will make it this sting the sooner. Cardinal Campius is stolen away to Rome, hath taken no leave, hath left the cause of the king unhandled, and is posted as the agent of our cardinal to second all this plot. But my, my lord, when returns Cranmer? Mm. He is returned in his opinions, which have satisfied the king for his divorce, together with all famous colleagues, almost in Christendom. Shortly, I believe, his second marriage shall be published and her coronation. Catherine no more shall be called queen, but princess dowager and widow to Prince Arthur. This same Cranmer's a worthy fellow and hath taken much pain in the king's business. Mm, he has, and we shall see him for it, an archbishop. So I hear. Uh, the, the cardinal! Observe, observe, he's moody. They stand aside. The packet Cromwell gave to you the king. With his own hand in his bedchamber. Looked he on the inside of the paper. Presently he did unseal them, and the first he viewed, he did it with a serious mind. A heed was in his countenance. You he bade attend him here this morning. Leave me a while. Exit Cromwell. It shall be the Duchess of Alençon, the French king's sister, he shall marry her. Anne Boleyn, no, I'll know Anne Boleyn's for him. There's more in it than fair visage. Boleyn? <laughs> no, we'll know Boleyn's. Speedily I wish to hear from Rome, the Marchioness of Pembroke, the late queen's gentlewoman, the knight's daughter, to be her mistress's mistress, the queen's queen. This candle burns not clear. This I must snuff it. Then out it goes. But though I know her virtuous and well-deserving, yet I know her for a spleeny Lutheran and not wholesome to our cause that she should lie in the bosom of our hard ruled king. <laughs> again, again, there is sprung up an heretic, an arch one, Cranmer. One hath crawled unto the favor of the king and his oracle. He's discontented. Maybe he hears the king. Sharp enough, Lord, for thy justice. The king, the king. What piles of wealth he hath accumulated to his own portion, and what expense by the hour seems to flow from him. How in the name of thrift does he rake this together? He sees the nobleman. Now, my lords, saw you the cardinal. Uh, my lord, we have stood here observing him. Some strange commotion is in his brain. He bites his lip and starts and stops on a sudden, looks upon the ground, then lays his finger on his temple, straight springs out into fast gait, then stops again, strikes his breast hard, and anon he casts his eye against the moon. In most strange postures, we have seen him set himself. It may well be there's mutiny in his mind. This morning, papers of state he sent me to peruse as I required, and what you have I found? There, on my conscience, put unwittingly, forsooth, an inventory, thus importing the several parcels of his plate, his treasure, rich stuffs, and ornaments of household, which I find at such proud rate that it outspeaks possession of a subject. It's heaven's will. Some spirit put this paper in the packet to bless your eye withal. King Henry takes his seat. Wolsey approaches. 
Heaven forgive me. Even God bless your highness. You have said well. And ever may your highness yoke together as I will lend you cause my doing well with my well saying. Tis well said again, and tis a kind of good deed to say well, and yet words are no deeds. My father loved you. He said he did, and with his deed did crown his word upon you. Since I had my office, I have kept you next to my heart, have not alone employed you where high profits might come home, but paired my present pre havings to bestow my bounties upon you, what should this mean? Have I not made you the prime man of the state? I pray you tell me if, if what I now pronounce you have found true. And if you may confess it, say with all, if you are bound to us or no, what say you? My sovereign, I confess your royal graces showered on me daily have been more than could my studied purposes requite which went beyond all man's endeavors. My endeavors have ever come too short of my own own desires, yet filed with my abilities. Mine own ends have been mine so that every evermore they pointed to the good of your most sacred person and the profit of the state. For your great graces heaped upon me, poor, Undeserver, I, I can nothing render but allegiant thanks. My prayers to heaven for you, my loyalty, which ever has and ever shall be growing till death that winter, kill it. Fairly answered. A loyal and obedient subject, it is therein illustrated. The honor of it does pay the act of it, and as the contrary, the foulness is the punishment. I presume that as my hand opened bounty to you, my heart dropped love, my power rained honor more on you than any. So your hand and heart, your brain, and every function of your power should, notwithstanding the, your bond of duty as for in love's particular, be more to me, your friend, than any. I do profess that for your highness's good I, had, I ever labored more than mine own that am, have, and will be, though all the world should crack their duty to you and throw it from their soul, though perils did abound as thick as thought could make them, and appear in forms more horrid, yet my duty, as doth a rock against the chiding flood, should the approach of this wild river break and stand, unshaken yours. Hmm, tis nobly spoken. Take notice, lords, he has a loyal breast, for you have seen him open it. He has Wolsey papers. Read all this, and after this, and then to breakfast with what appetite you have. Exit King Henry, frowning upon the cardinal. The nobles exit after him, smiling and whispering. What should this mean? What sudden anger is this? How have I reaped it? He parted frowning from me as if ruin leaped from his eyes. So looks the chafed lion upon the daring huntsman that has galled him, then makes him nothing. I must read this paper. I fear the story of his anger. He reads one of the papers. Tis so. This paper has undone me. Tis the account of all that world of wealth I have wealth I have drawn together for mine own ends, indeed, to gain the popedom and fee my friends in Rome. Oh, negligence, fit for a fool to lay by. What cross devil made me put this main secret in the packet I sent to the king? Is there no way to cure this? No new device to beat this from his brains? I have touched the highest point of all my greatness, and from that meridian of my glory, I haste now to my setting. I shall fall 
like a bright exhalation in the evening. And no man see me more. Re enter Norfolk, Suffolk, and Surrey. Uh, 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 hear the king's pleasure, Cardinal, who commands you to render up the great seal presently into our hands and to confine yourself to Asher House, my lord of Winchester's, till you hear further from his highness. Stay. Uh, where's your commission, lords? Words cannot carry authority so weighty. Who dares cross him bearing the king's will from his mouth expressly? Till I, for, till I find more than will or words to do it, I, I mean your malice. No, officious lords, I dare and must deny it. Now I feel of what coarse metal you are molded. Envy, how eagerly you follow my disgraces as it fed you, and how sleek and wanton you appear in everything may bring my ruin. How oh, your envious courses, men of malice. You have Christian warrant for them, and no doubt in time will find their fit rewards. That seal you ask with such a violence, the king, mine and your master, with his own hand gave me, bade me enjoy it with the place and honors during my life, and to confirm his goodness, tied it by letters patents. Now, who'll take it? The king that gave it. It must be himself, then. Thou art a proud traitor, priest. Proud lord, thou liest. Within these forty hours, Surrey does better have burnt that tongue than said so. Thy ambition, thou scarlet sin, robbed this bewailing land of noble Buckingham, my father-in-law. The heads of all thy brother cardinals with thee and all thy best parts bound together weighed not a hair of his. Plague of your policy. You sent me deputy for Ireland, far from his succor, from the king, from all that might have mercy on the fault thou gavest him, whilst your great goodness, out of holy pity, absolved him with an axe. This and all else, this talking lord can lay upon my credit. I answer is most false. The duke by law found his deserts. By and by I should tell you, you have as little honesty as honor, that in the way of loyalty and truth toward the king, my ever royal master, there mate a sounder man than Surrey can be. And all that love his follies. Now, my lords, can you endure to hear this arrogance? And from this fellow, if we live thus tamely to be thus jaded by a piece of scarlet, farewell nobility. Your goodness, since you provoke me, shall be most notorious. My Lord of Norfolk, as you are truly noble, as you respect the common good, the state of our despised nobility, our issues, whom, if he live, will scarce be gentlemen, produce the grand sum of his sins, the articles collected from his life. Those articles, my lord, are in the king's hands, uh, but thus much they are foul ones. So much fairer and spotless shall mine innocence arise when the king knows my truth. This cannot save you. I thank my memory. I yet remember some of these articles, and out they shall. First, that without the king's assent or knowledge, you wrought to be a legate, by which power you maim the jurisdiction of all bishops. Then that in you writ to Rome, or else to foreign princes, ego et rex muse, was still inscribed in which you brought the king to be your servant. Then, that without the knowledge either of the king or council, when you went ambassador to the emperor, you made bold to carry into Flanders the great seal. Item, you sent a large commission to Gregory de Casado to conclude without the king's will or the state's allowance, a league between his highness and Ferrara. That out of mere ambition, you have caused your holy hat to be stamped on the king's coin. 
then that you have sent innumerable substance, by, by what means got I leave to your own conscience, to furnish Rome and to prepare the ways you have for dignities to the mere undoing of all the kingdom. Many more there are which, since they are of you, and odious I will not taint my mouth wit. This is thy charge, Lord Cardinal. The king's further pleasure is, because all those things you have done of late by your power legative within this kingdom fall into the compass of a primineure, that therefore such a writh be sued against you to forfeit all your goods, lands, tenements, chattels, and whatsoever, and to be out of the king's protection. And so we'll leave you to your meditations how to live better. For your stubborn answer about giving about the giving back the great seal to us, the king shall know it and no doubt shall thank you. So fare you well, my good little Lord Cardinal. So farewell to the little good you bear me. Exeunt all but Rosie. Farewell. A long farewell to all my greatness. This is the state of man. Today he puts forth the tender leaves of hopes. Tomorrow blossoms and bears his blushing honors thick upon him. The third day comes a frost, a killing frost. And when he thinks, good easy man, full surely his greatness is a ripening, nips his root. And then he falls as I do. I have ventured like little wanton boys that swim on bladders this many summers in a sea of glory, but far beyond my depth, my high blown pride at length broke under me and now has left me weary and old with service to the mercy of a rude stream that must forever hide me. Vain pomp and glory of this world, I hate you! I feel my heart now open. Oh, how wretched is a, that poor man that hangs on princes' favors! There is betwixt that smile we would aspire to, that sweet aspect of princes and their ruin, more pangs and fears than wars or women have. And when he falls, he falls like Lucifer, never to hope again. And to Cromwell standing amazed. Why, how now, Cromwell? I have no power to speak, sir. What, amazed at my misfortunes? Can thy spirit wander a great man should decline nay and you weep i am fallen indeed what's news abroad the heaviest and the worst is that of your displeasure with the king the next is that sir thomas more is chosen lord chancellor in your place that's somewhat sudden but he's a learned man May he continue long in his highness's favor and do justice for truth's sake and his conscience. What more? That Cranmer is returned with welcome, installed Lord Archbishop Canterbury. That's news indeed. Last, that the Lady Anne, whom the king hath in secrecy long married, this oh. day was viewed and open as his queen going to chapel, and the voice is now only about her coronation. Oh, Cromwell, the king has gone beyond me. All my glories in that one woman I have lost forever. No son shall ever usher forth mine honors or gild again the noble troops that waited upon my smiles. Go, get thee from me, Cromwell. I am a poor, fallen man, unworthy now to be thy lord and master. Seek the king, that son, I pray, may never set. 
I have told him what and how true thou art. He will advance thee. Some little memory of me will stir him. I know his noble nature, not to let thy hopeful service perish too. Good Cromwell, neglect him not. Make use now and provide for thine own future safety. Oh, my Lord, must I then leave you? Must I needs forego so good, so noble, and so true a master? Bear witness, all that have not hearts of iron, with what a sorrow Cromwell leaves his lord. The king shall have my service, but my prayers forever and forever shall be yours. Cromwell, I did not think to shed a tear in all my miseries, but thou hast forced me out of thy honest truth to play the woman. Let's dry our eyes, and thus far hear me, Cromwell, and when I am forgotten as I shall be, and sleep in dull, cold marble, where no mention of me more must be heard of, say I taught thee, say Wolsey, that once trod the ways of glory, and sounded all the depths and shoals of honor, found thee a way out of this rack to rise in it, a sure and safe one, though thy master missed it. Mark but my fall, and that that ruined me. Cromwell, I charge thee, fling away ambition. By that sin fell the angels. How can man then, the image of his maker, hope to win by it? Love thyself last, cherish those hearts that hate thee. Corruption wins not more than honesty. Still in the right hand, carry gentle peace to silence envious tongues. Be just and fear not. Let all the ends thou aimest at be thy countries, thy gods and truths. Then, if thou fallst, O Cromwell, thou fallst a blessed martyr. Serve the king, and prithee, lead me in. There, take an inventory of all I have to the last penny. Tis the king's. My robe and my integrity to heaven is all I dare now call my own. Oh, Cromwell, Cromwell. Had I but served my God with half the zeal I served my king, he would not in mine age have left me naked to mine enemies. Good sir, have patience. So I have. Farewell. The hopes of court. My hopes in heaven do dwell. Exeunt. Act 4, Scene 1, A Street in Westminster. Later, first gentleman, second gentleman, meeting one another, the first, carrying a paper. Uh, you're well met once again. So are you. You come to take your stand here and behold the Lady Anne pass from her coronation. It is all my business. At a last encounter, the Duke of Buckingham came from his trial. Tis very true, but that time offered sorrow, this general joy, never greater, nor, I'll assure you, better taken, sir. May I be bold to ask what that contains, that paper in your hand? Uh, yes, tis the list of those that claim their offices this day. The Duke of Suffolk is the first and claims to be high steward. Next, the Duke of Norfolk, he is to be Earl Marshal, you may read the rest. But I beseech you, what's become of Catherine, the princess dowager? How goes her business? That I can tell you too. The Archbishop of Canterbury, accompanied with other learned and reverend fathers of his order, held a late court at Dunstable, six miles off from Amphill, where the princess lay, to which she was often cited by them, but appeared not. And to be short, 
for not appearance and the king's late scruple. By the main assent of all these learned men, she was divorced. And the late marriage made of none effect, since which she was removed to Kimbolton, where she remains now sick. Alas, good lady. The trumpets sound. Stand close. The queen is coming. Enter in this order a lively flourish of trumpets. Two judges, Lord Chancellor with the purse and mace before him. Choristers singing, oh, oh. Mayor of London bearing the mace. Then Garter oh. in his coat of arms and on his head a gilt of copper crown with Suffolk in his robe of estate, his coronet on his head bearing a long white wand as his as high steward. Gardner with him, Norfolk with the rod of marshalship, coronet on his head, collars of SS. Then enter a canopy borne by four of the sink ports under it, Queen Anne in her robe, in her hair richly adorned with pearl crowns. On each side, the Bishop of London and Gardner, now the Bishop of Winchester. Certain ladies or countesses with plain circlets of gold without flowers, bearing Queen Anne's train. Heaven bless thee. Thou hast the sweetest face I ever looked on. Sir, as I have a soul, she is an angel. Our king has all the Indies in his arms and more and richer when he strains that lady. I cannot blame his conscience. Mm. They, oh, they. One moment, sir. I've lost my, I've lost my way. Oh, God. They that bear the cloth of honor over her are four barons of the of the Sank ports. Those men are happy, and so are all near her. I take it she that carries up the train is that old noble lady, the Duchess of Norfolk. It is, and all the rest are countlesses. Uh, the coronets say so. These are stars indeed, and sometimes falling ones. Uh, no more of that. Mm. The coronation procession exits, having passed over the stage in order and state, and then a great flourish of trumpets. Enter a third gentleman. God save you, sir. Where have you been broiling? Among the crowd of the abbey. You saw the ceremony? Oh, that I did. How was it? Well worth the seeing. Good sir, speak it to us. Uh, as well as I am able, uh, the rich stream of lords and ladies, having brought the queen to a prepared place in the choir, uh, fell off a distance from her, while her grace sat down to rest a while, some half hour or so, in a rich chair of state, opposing freely the beauty of her person to the people. Believe me, sir, she is the goodliest woman that ever lay by man which when the people had the full view of, such a noise arose as the shrouds make it see in a stiff tempest as loud and to as many tunes, hats, cloaks, doublets, I think, flew up and had their faces been loose, this day they had been lost. Such joy I never saw before. But what followed? <clears throat> At length, her grace rose and with modest paces, came to the altar where she kneeled and saint light cast her fair eyes to heaven and prayed devoutly then rose again and bowed her to the people when by the archbishop of canterbury she had all the royal markings of a queen as holy oil edward confessor's crown uh, the rod and bird of peace and all such emblems laid nobly on her, which performed the choir with all the choicest music of the kingdom, together sung Te Deum. So she parted, and with the same full state, haste back again to York Place, where the feast is held. Sir, you must no more call it York Place. That's huh? past. Oh. For since the cardinal fell, that title's lost. Oh. Tis now the king's and called Whitehall. Oh, I know it, but tis so lately altered that the old name is fresh about me. What two reverend bishops were those that went on each side of the queen? Uh, Skokley and Gardner, the, the one of Winchester, newly preferred from the king's secretary, uh, the other, London. He of Winchester is 
held no great good lover of the archbishops, the virtuous Cranmer. <laughs> All the land knows that. However, yet there is no great breach. When it comes, Cranmer will find a friend, will not shrink from him. Who may that be, I pray you? Thomas Cromwell, a man in much esteem with the king, and truly a worthy friend. The king has made him master of the jewel house, and one already at the privy council. He will deserve more. Yes, without all doubt. But come, gentlemen, you shall go my way, which is to the court, and there you shall be my guests, something I can command. As I walk hither, I'll tell you more. You may command us, sir. Exeunt. Scene two, Kimbledon. Enter Catherine Dowager, sick, led by Patience, her woman. How does your grace? Oh, patient, sick to death. My legs, like loaden branches, bow to the earth, willing to leave their burden. Uh, reach a chair. She sits. So, now, methinks, I feel a little ease. Didst thou not tell me, Patience, as thou leadest me, that the great child of honor, Cardinal Wolsey, was dead? Good Patience, tell me how he died. It well, he stepped before me happily for my example. Well, the voice goes, madam. For after the stout Earl of Sunderland arrested him at York and brought him forward, as a man sorely tainted to his answer, he fell sick suddenly and grew so ill he could not sit his mule. Alas, poor man. At last, with easy roads, he came to Leicester, lodged in the abbey, where the reverend abbot, with all his convent, honorably received him, to whom he gave these words. O oh, father abbot, an old man, broken with the storms of state, is come to lay his weary bones among you. Give him a little earth for charity. So went to bed where eagerly his sickness pursued him still. And three nights after this, about the hour of eight, which he himself foretold should be his last, full of repentance, continual meditations, tears, and sorrows, he gave his honors to the world again, his blessed part to heaven, and slept in peace. So oh, may he rest. His faults lie gently on him. Yet thus far, patience, give me leave to speak him, and yet with charity, he was a man of an unbounded stomach, ever ranking himself with princes, one that by suggestion tied all the kingdom. Simony was fair play. His own opinion was his law. In the presence, he would say untruths and be ever double, both in his words and meaning. He was never, but where he meant to ruin, pitiful. His promises were as he then was mighty, but his performance, as he is now, nothing. Of his own body he was ill, and gave the clergy ill example. Noble madam, men's evil manners live in brass. The virtues we write in water. May peace be with him. Patience, be near me still, and set me lower. I have not long to trouble thee. Good lady, cause the musicians play me that sad note I named my knell whilst I sat meditating, while I sit meditating on that celestial harmony I go to. She is asleep. Let us sit down quiet now for fear we wake her. Softly, gentle patience. They sit. Catherine has a vision. Enter solemnly tripping one after another six personages clad in white robes, wearing on their heads garlands of bays and golden vizards on their faces, branches of bays or palm in their hands. Their first kanji unto her then dance, and at certain changes the first two hold spare garland over her head, at which the other four make reverent curtsies. Then the two that hold the garland deliver the same to the next two who observe the same order in their changes and holding the garland over her head, which done, they deliver the same garland to the last two, who likewise observe the same order, at which 
as it were by inspiration. She makes in her sleep signs of rejoicing and holds up her hands to heaven. And so in their dancing vanish, carrying the garland with them, the music continues, Catherine awakes. Spirits of peace, where are you? Are you all gone and leave me here in wretchedness behind you? Madam, I am here. Um, it, it, it is not you I call for. Saw you none enter since I slept? None, madam. No? Saw you not even now a blessed troop invite me to a banquet whose bright... Oh. No, no. Saw you not <laughs> even now a blessed troop invite me to a banquet whose bright faces cast thousand beams upon me like the sun. They promised me eternal happiness and brought me garlands, patience, which I feel I am not worthy yet to wear. I shall assiduously. How much her grace is altered on the sudden. See how long her face is drawn. How pale she looks and of an earthy cold. She is going. Knock within. Enter Lord Capuchius. I humbly do entreat your highness's pardon. My haste made an unmannerly entreat. Uh, my sight fail not. You should be Lord Ambassador from the Emperor, my royal nephew, and your name Capucius. 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 Madam, the same, your servant. Oh, my lord, the times and titles now are altered strangely with me since first you knew me. But I pray you, wh what is your pleasure with me? Noble lady, first, mine own service uh, to your grace. The next, the king's request that I would as much for your weakness and by me send you his princely commendations and heartily entreats you to take Good comfort. Oh, my good Lord, that comfort comes too late. Tis like a pardon after execution. That gentle psychic given in time had cured me, but now I am past all comforts here but prayers. How does His Highness? Madam, in good health. So may he ever be so and ever flourish. When I shall dwell with worms and my poor name vanished the kingdom. Patience, is that letter I caused you write yet sent away? No, madam. She presents a paper to Catherine who gives it to Capuchus. Sir, I most humbly pray you to deliver this to my lord the king. Most willingly, madam. In which I have commanded uh, to his goodness the model of our chaste loves, his younger daughter. The dews of heaven fall thick in blessings on her, beseeching him to give her virtuous breeding. She is young and of noble, modest nature. I hope she will deserve well and a little to love her for her mother's sake that loved him. Heaven knows how dearly. Urge the king to do me this last rite. By heaven I will, or live of a man. I thank you, honest Lord. Remember me in all humility unto his highness. Say his long trouble now is passing out of this world. <laughs> Tell him in death I blessed him, for so I will. Mine eyes grow dim. Uh, farewell, my Lord, my good nephew. Nay, nay, patience, you must not leave me yet. I must to bed. Call in more women. When I am dead, good wench, let me be used with honor. Strew me over with maiden flowers that all the world may know I was a chaste wife to my grave. Embalm me, then lay me forth. Although unqueened, yet like a queen and daughter to a king, inter me. I can no more. Exeunt, leaving Catherine. Act five, scene one, London, a gallery in the palace. Enter Gardner with a torch before him, met by Lovell. 
Ah, it has struck the hour of one o'clock. These should be hours for of necessities, not for delights. Times to repair our nature with comforting repose and not for us to waste these times. Good hour of night, Sir Thomas, whither so late? I must go to the king before he go to bed. The queen's in labor, they say in great extremity, and feared she'll with the labor end. The fruit she goes with, I pray for heartily, that it may find good time and live. But for the stock, Sir Thomas, I wished it grubbed up now. He thinks I could cry the amen, and yet my conscience says she's a good creature, and sweet lady does deserve our better wishes. But sir, sir, hear me, Sir Thomas. You're a gentleman of mine own way. I know you wise, religious, and let me tell you, it will ne'er be well. It will not, Sir Thomas Lovell, take it of me till Cranmer, Cromwell, her two hands, and she sleep in their graves. Now, sir, you speak of two the most remarked in the kingdom. As for Crom Cromwell, besides that of the jewel house, he's master of, of the rolls. And the king's secretary, further, sir, stands in the cap and trade of more preferments with, with which the time will load him. The archbishop is the king's hand and tongue. And who dare speak one syllable against him? Yes, yes, Sir Thomas. There are that dare, and I myself have ventured to speak my mind of him. And indeed this day, sir, I may tell you, I think, I have uh, ins incensed the lords of the council that is that he is, for so I know he is, they know he is, a most arch heretic, a pestilence that does infect the land, which with which they, moved, have broken with the king, who have so far given ear to our complaint of his great grace and princely care for seeing these fell mischiefs, our reasons laid before him, hath commanded tomorrow morning to the council board, he be convened. He's a rank weed, Sir Thomas, and we must root him out. From your affairs I hinder you too long. Good night, Sir Thomas. Many good nights, my lord. I rest your servant. Exit Gardner, enter King Henry. Now, Lovell, from the Queen, what is the news? Uh, I could not personally deliver to her what you commanded me, but by her woman I sent your message, who returned her thanks in the greatest humbleness, and desired your highness most heartily to pray for her. What sayest thou, huh? To pray for her? What? Is she, is she crying out? So said her woman. Suffering made almost each pang a death. Oh, alas, good lady. God safely, safely quit her of her burden, and with gentle travail to the gladding of my thoughts, with an air. Enter a servant. Sirrah, what follows? Sir, I have brought my lord the archbishop as you commanded me. Ha! Huh. Canterbury, bring him to us. Exit servant. Uh, this is about that which the bishop spake. Ah, uh, I am happily come hither. We enter servant with Cranmer. Avoid the gallery. <laughs> and Lovell. said, be gone. What? Exit, exit Lovell and servant. I am fearful. Wherefore it frowns he thus? This is aspect of terror. All's not well. How now, my lord? You do, des do desire to know wherefore I send for you? Cranmer kneels. It is my duty to attend, attend your highness' pleasure. Pray you, uh, arise, my good and gracious lord of Canterbury. Come, you and I must walk a, a, a turn together. I have news to tell you. Come, come, give me your hand. He rises. Ah, my good lord, I grieve at what I speak, and am right sorry to repeat what follows. I have, and most unwillingly of late, heard many grievous... I do say, my lord, grievous complaints of you, which, being considered, hath moved us and our counsellor that you shall this morning come before us, where I know you cannot with such freedom purge yourself, but that till further trial in those charges, which will require your answer, 
you must take your patience to you and be well contented to make your house our tower. You a brother of us, it fits we thus proceed, or else no witness would come against you. Cranmer kneels again. I humbly thank you, your highness, and am right glad to catch this good occasion most thoroughly to be winnowed, where my chaff and corn shall fly asunder. For I know there's none stands under more calamitous tongues than myself, poor man. Oh, st stand up, good Canterbury. Thy truth and thy integrity is rooted in us, thy friend. Give me thy hand. Stand up. He rises. Prithee, let's walk. Now, by my paladin, what manner of man are you? My lord, I looked you would have given me your petition that I should have taken some pains to bring together yourself and your accusers, and to have heard you without endurance further. Most dread liege, the good I stand on is my truth and honesty. If thou shalt fail, I with my enemies with triumph over my person, which I weigh not, being of those virtues wicked, Faked, I fear nothing what can be said against me. Hmm. Know you not how your state stands in the world, with the whole world? Your enemies are many and not small. Their practices must bear the same proportion. And not ever the justice and the truth of the question carries the due of the verdict with it. At what ease might corrupt minds procure knaves as corrupt to swear against you? Such things have been done. You are greatly opposed and with a malice of as great size. God and your majesty protect mine innocence or I fall into the trap is laid for me. Be of good cheer. They shall no more prevail than we give way to. Keep comfort to you and this morning see you do appear before them. If they, if they shall chance in charging you with matters, to commit you, the best persuasions to the contrary, fail not to use, and with what vehemency the occasion shall instruct you. If entreaties will render you no remedy, this ring deliver them, and your appeal to us there make before them. He gives Cranmer a ring. Oh, look, the good man weeps. He's honest on mine honor. Get you gone, and do as I have bid you. Exit Cranmer. He has strangled his language in his tears. Come back. Um, uh, come back. What mean you? Enter old lady, followed by Lovell. Uh, I'll not come back. The tidings that I bring will make my boldness ma manners. Now, good angels, fly o'er thy royal head and shade the person under their blessed wings. Now, by thy looks, I guess thy message. Is the queen delivered? I and say of a boy? Oh, uh, tis a girl. Promise his boys hereafter. S sir, your, your queen desires your visitation and to be acquainted with this stranger. Tis as you like, as cherry is to cherry. Lovell, give her, say, a hundred marks. I'll to the queen. Exit King Henry. A hundred marks? By this light, I'll have more. An ordinary groom is for such payment. I will have more or scold it out of him. Exeunt, old lady with Lovell. Scene two, before the council chamber. Pursuivants, pages, and company attendant. Enter Cranmer. I hope I am not too late. And yet the gentleman that was sent to me from the council prayed me to make great haste. He tries the door. <coughs> All fast. What means this? Oh, who waits there? Pray heaven, for certain this is a purpose laid by some that hate me. God turn their hearts. I never sought their malice to quench mine honor. They would shame to make me wait else at door. A fellow counselor, mong boys, grooms and lackeys. But their pleasures must be fulfilled and I attend their patience. 
Inside the council chamber, a table is brought in with chairs and stools and placed under the state. Enter Lord Chancellor, places himself at the upper end of the table on the left hand, a seat being left void above him. As for Canterbury seat, Suffolk, Norfolk, Surrey, Chamberlain, and Gardiner seat themselves in an order on each side. Cromwell, at lower end as secretary, King Henry enters unnoticed in the window above and draws the curtain. Speak to the business, Master Secretary. Why are we met in council? Please, Your Honors, the Chief Cause concerns His Grace of Canterbury. Has he had knowledge of it? Yes. Who waits without? My Lord Archbishop, and has done half an hour to know your pleasures. Let him come in. An attendant unlocks the door. Cranmer approaches the council table. My good Lord Archbishop, I'm very sorry to sit here at this present and behold that chair stand empty. But we are all men in our own natures frail and capable of our flesh. Few are angels, out of which frailty and want of wisdom you, that best should teach us, have misdemeaned yourself, and not a little, toward the king first, then his laws, in filing the whole realm by your teaching and your chaplains, for so we are informed with new opinions, diverse and dangerous, which are heresies and not reformed may prove pernicious. And what follows then? Commotions, uproars with a general taunt on a general taint of the whole state. As of late days, our neighbors, the upper Germany can dearly witness yet freshly pitted in our memories. My good lords, hitherto in all the progress, both of my life and office, I have labored and with no little study that my teaching and the strong course of my authority <laughs> might go one way and safely. And the end was ever to do well. Nor is there living, I speak it with a single heart, my lords, of man that more detests, more states against both in his private conscience and his place, defacers of a public peace than I do. Pray heaven the king may never find a heart with less allegiance in it. Men that make envy and crooked malice nourishment dare bite the best I do beseech your lordships that in this case of justice, my accusers, be what they will, may stand forth face to face and freely urge against me. Nay, my lord, that cannot be. You are a counselor and by that nature, virtue, no man dare accuse you. My lord, because we have business of more moment, we will be short with you. Tis his highness's pleasure and our consent for better trial of you from hence you are committed to the tower where being but a private man again you shall know many dare accuse you, you boldly more than I fear you are provided for. Ah, uh, my good Lord of Winchester, I thank you. You are always my good friend. If your will pass, I shall both find your lordship judge and juror. You are so merciful. I see your end. Is my undoing love and meekness, Lord, become a churchman better than ambition, wind straying souls with modesty again? Cast none away that I shall clear myself. Lay all the weight you can upon my patience. I make as little doubt as you do conscience in doing daily wrongs. I could say more, but reverence to your calling makes me modest. My Lord, my Lord, you are a sectary. That's the plain truth. Your painted gloss discovers 
two men what understand you, words and weakness. My Lord of Winchester, you're a little, by your good favor, too sharp. Men so noble, however faulty, yet should find respect for what they have been. It is a cruelty to load a falling man. Good, sir, good master secretary, I cry your honor mercy. You may worst of all this table say so. Why, my lord? Do not I know you for a favorer of this new sect? You are not sound. Not sound? Not sound, I say. Would you were half so honest. Men's prayers then would seek you, not their fears. I shall remember this bold language. Do remember your bold life too. Chancellor. Ah, this is too much. Forbear for shame, my lords. I have done. And I. Then thus for you, my lord, it stands agreed, I take it by all voices, that forthwith you be conveyed to the tower a prisoner, there to remain till the king's further pleasure be known unto us. Is there no other way of mercy? But I must need to the tower, my lords. What other would you expect? You are strangely troublesome. Let some of the guard be ready there. Enter the guard. For me? Must I go like a traitor thither? Receive him and see him safe in the tower. S stay, good my lords. I have little yet to stay. Look here, my lords. He holds out the ring. By virtue of that ring, I take my cause out of the grips of cruel men and give it to the most noble judge, the king, my master. Tis the right ring, by heaven. I told you all when we first put this dangerous stone rolling, t'would fall upon ourselves. Do you think, my lords, the king will suffer but the little finger of this man to be vexed? A tis now too certain. How much more is his life in value with him? Would I were fairly out on it. My mind gave me in seeking tales and informations against this man, whose honesty the devil and his disciples only envy at. You blew the fire that burns you. Now have at you. Enter King Henry below, frowning on them, he takes his seat. And sovereign, how much are we bound to heaven in daily thanks that gave us such a prince, not only good and wise, but most religious, one that in all obedience makes the church the chief aim of his honor, and to strengthen that holy duty out of dear respect, his royal self in judgment comes to hear the cause betwixt her and this great offender. You were ever good at sudden commendations, Bishop of Winchester. But no, I come not to hear such flattery now. And in my presence, there are too thin and base to hide offenses to me you cannot reach. You play the spaniel and think with wagging of your tongue to win me. Whatsoever thou takes for me, takes me for, I'm sure thou hast a cruel nature and a bloody good man sit down. Cranmer takes his seat. Now, let me see the proudest he that dares most but wag his finger at thee. By all that's holy, he had better starve than but once think this place biz becomes thee not. May it please your grace to- No, sir, it does not please me. I had thought I had men of some understanding and wisdom of my counsel, but I find none. Was a discretion, lords, to let this man, this good man, few of you deserve that title, this honest man, wait for a loud, like a lousy footboy at chamber door, and one as great as you are? Why, what a shame was this. Did my commission bid you to so forget yourselves? I gave you power as he was a counselor to try him, not as a groom. There's some of you, I see, more out of malice than integrity, would try him to the utmost, had you mean, which you shall never have while I live. Thus far, my most dread sovereign, 
may it like your grace to let my tongue excuse all. What was purposed concerning his imprisonment was rather, if there be faith in men, meant for his trial and fair purification <laughs> the world than malice, I'm sure, in me. Well, well, my lords, respect him. Make me no more ado, but I all embrace him. Be friends for shame, my lords. They embrace Cranmer. My lord of Canterbury, I have a suit which you must not deny me. That is a fair young maid that yet wants baptism. You must be godfather and answer for her. The greatest monarch now alive may glory in such an honor. And let heaven be my witness how dear I hold this confirmation. Oh, good man, these joyful tears show thy true heart. The common voice I see is verified of thee, which says thus, Do my lord of Canterbury a shrewd turn, and he's your friend forever. Come, lords, we trifle time away. I long to have this young one made a Christian, as I have made you one, lords. One remains so I grow stronger. You have more honor gain. Exeunt. Scene three, the palace yard. Enter trumpets sounding, King Henry and guard. Two aldermen, Lord Mayor, Garter, Cranmer, Norfolk, with his marshal's staff. Suffolk, two noblemen bearing the great standing bowls for the christening gifts. Then four noblemen bearing a canopy under which a train of ladies in waiting bearing the child richly habited in a mantle, train borne by a lady. The troop passes once about the stage. Heaven from thy endless goodness send prosperous life long and ever happy to the high and mighty princess of England, Elizabeth. Flourish, Cranmer kneels. And to your royal grace and the good queen, my noble partners and myself thus pray all comfort, joy in this most gracious lady. Heaven ever laid up to make parents happy may hourly fall upon you. Stand up, sir, and thank you, good Lord. He stands. With this kiss, take my blessing. King Henry kisses the infant. God protect thee, into whose hand I give thy life. Amen. Let me speak, sir, for heaven now bids me the words I utter, let none think flattery, for they'll find them truth. This royal infant, though in her cradle, yet now promises upon this land a thousand, thousand blessings, which time shall bring to ripeness. She shall be a pattern to all princes living with her and all that shall succeed. Saba was never more covetous of wisdom and fair virtue than this pure soul shall be. All princely graces, thy mold up such a mighty peace as thus is with all the virtues that attend the good shall be doubled on her. Truth shall nurse her. Holy and heavenly thought still counsel her, shall be loved, she shall be loved and feared. Her own shall bless her, her foes shake like the field of beaten corns and hang their heads with sorrow. Good grows with her in her days, every man shall eat in safety under her own vine, which he plants and sing the merry songs of peace to all his neighbors. God shall truly known, and those about her from her shall read the perfect ways of honor, and by those claim their greatness. Not by blood, nor shall this peace sleep with her, but as when the bird of wonder dies, the maiden Phoenix, her ashes new create another heir as great in administration as herself. So shall she leave her blessedness to one. When heaven shall call her from this cloud of darkness, who from the sacred ashes of her honor shall star-like rise 
as great in fame as she was, and so stand fixed. Peace, plenty, love, truth, terror, that were the servants to this chosen infant shall then be his, and like a vine grow to him, wherever the bright sun of heaven shall shine, his honor and the greatness of his name shall be, and make new nations. He shall flourish, and like a mountain cedar reach his branches to all the plains about him. Our children's children shall see this and bless heaven. Oh, thou speakest wonders. She shall be to the happiness of England an age's princess. Many days shall see her, and yet no day without a deed to prove. Would I had known no more, but she must die. She must, the saints must have her, yet a virgin. A most unspoiled lily shall she pass to the ground, and all the world shall mourn her. Oh, Lord Archbishop, thou hast made me now a man. Never before this happy child did I get anything. This oracle of comfort has so pleased me that when I am in heaven, I shall desire... I shall desire to see what this child does and praise my maker. I thank you all, to you, my good Lord Mayor, and you, good brethren, I am much beholding. I have received much honor by your presence, and you shall find me thankful. Lead the way, lords. You must all see the queen, and she must thank you. She will be sick else. This day no man think has business at his house, for all shall stay. This little one shall make it a holiday. Thank you, Epilogue. This ten to one, this play can never please all that are here. Some come to take their ease and sleep an act or two. <laughs> but those we fear we frighted with our trumpets, so tis clear. They say tis naught others to hear the city abused extremely and to cry, that's witty. Which we have not done either. That I fear all the expected good we're like to hear. For this play at this time is only in the merciful construction of good women. For such a one we showed them. If they smile and say twill do, I know within a while all the best men are ours. For tis, for tis little hap that they hold when their ladies bid them clap. Exit epilogue. End of play. Excellent, excellent epilogue. And uh, it, inspires, uh, it inspires me next time I direct a play, I'm going to have trumpets in it to wake up everybody <laughs> sitting in the first row. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>